podcast we are giggling because we're so excited because we have such an amazing guest today i'm sarah wright olson and i'm Teresa palma <laughs> <laughs> hi daisies um hi. Teresa, why don't you give us a little intro yes hi guys we are so excited because today we are interviewing the most amazing katherine schwarzenegger she is a mom of two she's a stepmom she is a best-selling author and she hosts this amazing thing on her platforms called BDA Baby, which is before, during, and after. And Sarah yes. and I have both actually been a part of that conversation, which has been yeah. so great. We're so excited to have her today, Catherine Aww. Schwarzenegger. Thank Welcome. You. Thank you for having me. <laughs> You're an acclaimed author from such a young age. Sarah and I were laughing about this. We're like, oh my gosh, how accomplished from such a young age. Like, mo- you're so like, motivated. Wow. Like at that age, I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to go to um, yoga and then I'm going to get a smoothie and oh, then I'm going to go. <laughs> I don't, I mean, you guys were doing your own things for sure. Very ambitious and so motivated. I happen uh, to be like, you know, just really fired up about like, all of all things body image oriented. And it was like such a a time where now we talk about it so much, which is so amazing. But when I became really interested in it, like nobody was really talking about it. So I was very fired up about it. And that's why I did it. But you guys are way more than motivated <laughs> all the time uh, and have one million children. So we're all good. <laughs> that's true. We do have one million children. Well, I wanted to I wanted to talk a little bit about that because um, you really did start that conversation like so far before um like any of this stuff sort of like this whole like snapchat world of like filters and tiktok i don't know all the platforms i only have instagram because i can't manage more (laughs) than one thing in my brain i was Um, like is snapchat even around i I don't know know. i don't know (laughs) i think i think it was a thing um anyway so but but um i was we were talking about this the other day because I was like making a joke and sending a picture to my friend and I hadn't slept the whole night because my baby had been sick. And so I sent this picture and I was like very filtered as a joke to her. It made my lips big and my cheeks sunken and like all this stuff. And I was like, I didn't sleep at all last night. And she was like, ha ha, amazing. (laughs) And but I was like, this is so sick, though, because this face that I saw is so there's so many faces like that that I'm seeing on Instagram all the time where people are just Mm. like, this is me, you know, and it's so unreal realistic. And so you wrote a book about loving yourself um, for who you are and what's on the inside. And I think that's amazing. And you did that. How old were you when you wrote that book? So I was 19 when I wrote the book. (laughs) But I will say that, I mean, of course, the The reason that I wrote the book was just, you know, being a young woman in Los Angeles and just, um, you know, feeling all the pressures that you kind of experience when you turn on the television or, you know, then we were still reading magazines all the time, just like looking at all of these images of these like absolutely flawless, beautiful, super thin and perfect women and being like, oh, you know, especially when you go through puberty, just like what is all of a sudden I have hips and a butt and boobs and like, what is I'm not comfortable in this body. And then you know, just feeling pressure all the time to look and be a certain way and also to kind of be everything that you're not. And Mm -hmm. so I, as the kind of older girl in my cousin group and having so many younger girls around me who were stressed out about that and talking about being fat at like age nine, which I thought was insane. It Mm. got me really fired up and passionate about it. And then now at this phase in my life, since it's, you know, it's been a minute since I was 19, but it's, uh, it, it body image is something that, you know, follows you throughout life and also your relationship with your body and also how you view yourself changes so much, especially as you get older and then you, you know, feel like, oh, I have the hang of like my body and I f- feel comfortable in my body. And then you, you know, for me, I was in when I first started dating Chris, I was like, oh my God, I feel like so great. I'm with such a supportive partner. And then you also, then you get pregnant and then you're like, now my body's changing again. I mean, you both know this so well, like then your relationship with your body changes again. And then postpartum, it changes again. And then when you get pregnant again, so it's kind of, um, my mom told me when I was talking about it so much, when I was younger, she was like, this is amazing that you're talking about it. And it's so, 
you know, great, you're passionate about it. And also know that this isn't something that you're just going to like close the chapter on and not right. open back up like this, your relationship the with the way you view yourself and your body will last with you forever. Yeah. And it's how you handle that relationship and also like how you think through it and how you view yourself and, you know, about positive talk and negative self-talk, all those kinds of things mm -hmm. that we need to be more aware of. And then also being a girl mom, you're aware of it even more. And mm -hmm. um, so it's like, it's ever changing for me. So I'm like, even though this was like 14 years ago or whatever that I wrote that, I still have so many thoughts constantly just like about the subject of body image in general. It's wild. So we need book two. That's what's happening. <laughs> no, so we, need, yeah. <laughs> we need, it's been 14 Where's years. Wow. <laughs> things have changed. Um, and here we go. <laughs> you know? I know. Yeah. Because yeah. I guess back then it wasn't like the peak of Instagram and the social media movement. I guess that was just really. It was like Photoshop. It was Photoshop over it was Photoshop. magazines yeah, it was like, yes. and like, it yeah. Was when those kind of the those videos, I remember it so well when those videos came out that showed you what magazines yes. do with a picture. It was like that oh, was yes, our version yes. of an Instagram filter where you That's really saw right. like this is what a model or an actress or, you know, um, a person looks like. And then this is what they look like after an editing team has kind of gotten their hands on the picture. And you kind of yes. watched as things came in yes. and noses shrunk, hair changed. Like you watch that and you were like, oh my gosh, that's so crazy. And then now to think that we have the ability to do that every single day at any given moment. In real time. In real time. And also, you know, at such a young age, I'm so grateful mm. I didn't grow up with, like I grew up oh. with kind of the tail end of Facebook, but like mm -hmm. Instagram for young girls, especially I'm just, I also look at, I don't know if you guys do this, but I sometimes will drive by schools when they're getting let out. Like if I happen mm -hmm. to be driving in my neighborhood and I'll see kind of like tween teen girls coming out or walking around, you know, the village and neighborhoods that we go. And I look at them and I'm like, I never looked like that. <laughs> So I was like, oh my gosh, I looked, so, I looked so awkward. I was in like a matching terry cloth juicy jumpsuit and I had braces and like, I look at totally. these girls and I'm like, what do you look like that? Like I the know. dress to the nines. The, yeah. We actually had a role at our school. I went to a very Catholic school. It was very conservative. So we had a rule about the length of our skirts. Like we did we, too. Yes. Did you? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we couldn't wear jewelry. We couldn't wear makeup. We had to have our skirts like... Uh, two inches below the knee it couldn't come up any higher so mm -hmm. it was everything was very conservative even if I wanted to wear makeup I wasn't allowed to wear makeup it's such right. a different place now and I was at an event the other night um with a friend of mine and we were just like two mums going to this event and I hadn't been to an event in so long actually <laughs> Sarah was meant to come with me and I messaged her I was like oh my god you'd be so happy you're not here <laughs> we get to this event it's the first one I've said yes to in about six years I was like, oh, why not? This will be fun. Took my girlfriend and we walked in and we were like, oh, my gosh. Everyone is so much young. Everyone was about, yeah. I'd say median age, like 21. And I was oh, like, God. woo, I'm like the mum here. And all the girls looked so mature, so much makeup, all the the fake lashes, the everything. And I was like, wow. I just felt like I really... I was like, I don't think I belong. I just don't belong anymore. Yeah. I wouldn't have belonged there in be my, my Christy Dawn dress and my Oh my uh, gosh, I was hair. like, wow. <laughs> Everyone's so like mature and th they looked so mature. And I was like, uh, it's so much. It's just a, it's a stage right now. I think in the beauty industry, it it's like a lot of the girls were there talking about, you know, we're walking past, we're hearing about fillers and Botox and all the things that they're doing. Yeah. And I was like, it's just a different world. And I'm, I am grateful that yeah. I wasn't an, sort of at an impressionable age when all of this stuff was blowing up and in my face. Like I didn't have access to a lot of this when I was 14, 15, 16. And if I did, I would have had a full blown eating disorder. I'm absolutely sure of it because the moment I came to LA and I started hearing like whisperings of how like your body should look and how you should feel. And, um, I, I started having disordered eating. I got to 21 and I had an agent look at me and be like, 
well, actually, you know, a part of your job is to look good and a part of your job is to look good in a bikini and to work out and you don't work out and you don't eat healthy enough and so downward spiral into full-blown disordered eating for me. Yeah, that is I mean, it, it makes me like so nervous for, I mean, we all have daughters. It's like it's such a crazy thing to think about. Obviously, you hope that you can raise them, you know, to be comfortable and confident and also feel comfortable coming to you when they have insecurities about those things. But also like, I mean, you two both like had, you know, people commenting on your appearance and your body at such a young age, even though it wasn't necessarily on a filter or a social right. media platform, you definitely experience it in a very unique way. And so I think obviously like you'll have your own ways of implementing what you know and having knowledge for your girls, but it's definitely a wild time. So what do you think you'll do for, before we pivot to a different uh, book and topic, I wanted to ask you, what do you think you'll do in terms of like phones and social media and stuff like that for your kids? Like, you know, when they get to that age, because my thought is like, I'm, I just like, I was saying this the other day on one of our podcasts, but I'm like, I just have this image in my brain of like me dropping my phone, running barefoot into the forest with all of my kids and just being like, we're out. I'm done. Yeah. I can't do it. I Cause I'm just <laughs> like <laughs> tapping, nice. tapping out. Um, and yeah. that is like such a fairy dream that, you know, doesn't necessarily exist, but like, you know, I, I'm just so against the idea of that at such a young age for my kids, because I, I know what it would have done to me. So like, what do you, how do you think you'll handle that with your girls? I mean, I feel like I have been reading because I have a 10 year old stepson. So I've definitely been reading more about, you know, kids and social media and, you know, having devices. I'm definitely a big advocate of, no electronics and, um, you know, kind of going back to the way that we all grew up, which was like, yes. go outside and play or play with your brothers mm -hmm. and sisters, play with your sibling, go be bored, like, you know, yeah. enjoy the time where you're bored, come to me and tell me that you're bored. Like sometimes when, when, uh, if someone comes to me and says like, oh, I'm bored, even my, my 13 year old cousin, she'll come here and she'll be like, I'm bored. I'm like, great. <laughs> like, yeah. this is, you know, <laughs> go get, go color, go do an arts and crafts. Like we, yeah really, you know, my mom and my dad never allowed us to turn on the TV during the week. There was, the TV was never on when the sun was out ever. We were allowed to watch like a family movie on a weekend together as a family. But even when I was in high school, I wasn't allowed to watch, you know, any of the reality TV shows. We had TiVo back then, but I never, like, we would always argue over who was going to get the TiVo slot of that, <laughs> you know, that time frame. So <laughs> yes. we didn't, like, I didn't watch a lot of the shows and like the reality shows, especially that were going on when I was in high school, because I wasn't allowed to. Yeah. And I remember that I was the last one of all my friends to get a cell phone, which of course was, you know, a Nokia flip phone um, <laughs> when I was in eighth grade. And I was so upset about it. I constantly was telling my parents, I was like, I'm going to be such a loser because you guys won't let me have a cell phone. And I fully intend on like definitely waiting until at least ninth grade for my you know, girls to yeah. have a cell phone. And even Same. then I would have a cell phone where it's like a flip phone. Like they don't need more where than the internet you know. is cut off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like they don't need, if they want to call me, if they want to go hang out with their friends, you know, walk around or whatever, that's, that's one thing. And then you can call me to pick you up or whatever. But I, I definitely don't think giving access to the internet or all these social media platforms is something that I'm interested in or think that I, you know, that we would do at all. Um, obviously my oldest daughter is two and a half, so I have a minute, but <laughs> it's even, you know, even I look at these, um, my family, when I was growing up, my mom and my dad were so big on family dinners and mm -hmm. all sitting down at the dinner table together. Even when my dad was governor and he was, you know, going back and forth from LA to Sacramento, we still did family dinners every night at seven o'clock. We all sat together, no matter how much homework we had, you know, what we had to do if, you know, someone needed to do this. We all sat down together with no devices. Yes. And it was such an important part of us all checking in with one another and, yes. you know, seeing what was going on in this person's life and, you know, what this person had happened at school or, you know, and it was such a big part of my childhood growing up and also 
my like the formation of who I am, especially through my teenage years where you don't necessarily want to go and sit with your parents or your siblings at dinner. My parents made me and yeah. I'm really grateful that they did because it really allowed us to all kind of be able to have freedom to do our own thing and kind of grow up, but also all be connected in a really healthy way. And I go out to dinner sometimes or out to meals and I see these families that are sitting at tables where the parents are all on their cell phones and kids have iPads propped up in front of them with headphones on. And I'm not, you know, I don't judge parents if they need, you know, if you need to hand a kid an iPad, by all means, hand a kid an iPad, I guess everybody has their own journey. But I just look at these families who sit and they're all sitting at a table together and they're not talking. Yeah. And it makes me so sad that... Yeah you know, that, uh, that's how people are growing up now. It's like, you're mm -hmm. sitting at the table and you're not even talking to who's sitting next to you. Right. And, um, and so I think that's definitely important. It's something that Chris and I talk a lot about is just like how to have boundaries with that and also have boundaries with kids, especially as they grow up and become more aware of you being on a device and not being present. Cause I, yeah, I had such present parents and it was such a blessing that I definitely it's important to me to have that. So Ugh, I love that. And I, I so agree with the I feel like if you can do one thing and you're if you're wanting to find a time of connection, if you can do one thing, it's family dinner night. I really think that is so important um, to spend that time together, just to check in, ask the questions, like just talk about your day. We have different themes that we do during the week. So it's like one night story night, one night is problem solving night. And we just go through with the kids and we have, you know, but it's every night at five o'clock, we sit down together and we do dinner. And, um, I just, it's my favorite thing. And I look mm -hmm. back and I think like, oh yeah, my dad, always cooked dinner. He always had it ready early because he wanted to be in bed at nine. And um, just like your too. husband, just yeah. like my husband, shocker. So, I love that. Like, oh I love God. that. <laughs> I just, I love hearing that. And I think, you know, there's something, there's definitely pieces of the traditional childhood that we had that were without devices that we can go back and go, you know what, that did work really well. Yeah. And this was yeah. really special. We should take some of those pieces and apply them to, you know, this modern day where everything can become very electronic heavy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And you're awesome. right, you touched on the, the word, I think it's presence, really. Yes. Because yeah. if you see someone in their phone, they're suddenly in, an, in a whole different world. They're like yes. in their own environment. And if you've ever tried talking to your kids and it's their like iPad time, our kids get two hours of iPad only on the weekends, an hour, two hours broken up, an hour in the morning, an hour later, or they can watch a movie. So, but if I ever try and communicate with them and they're in their device, they're like, it just nothing goes through because no. they're just yeah, literally completely nothing. distracted and separate. So I, yeah, we have that same rule as well. Even if it's in the smack bang in the middle of their precious iPad time, because they really, I feel like my kids are so starved of screens in our family <laughs> compared to a lot of families yeah. at their school. Even if it's right in the middle of that, it's just absolutely such a big no-no that anyone brings their device to the table because that is your opportunity to look each other in the eye and connect and check in. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. also like, it's crazy. And I, I'm not quite there yet with my um, two and a half year olds, but it's also, it makes you um, really, at least for me, I look back at who my parents had us hang out with when we were kids. And it was a lot of parents who had very similar beliefs as far as how they want to raise their kids. Mm -hmm. And it's something that, you know, when it comes to technology as well, it's like you, when you have this, cause we were in COVID for so long, especially like I became a mom in COVID. So I didn't really Ugh. like, there were certain parts of, you know, the parenting journey or motherhood that is very, I didn't really start thinking about until, you know, recently. And who you have your kids around or what they're exposed to based on like how another person wants to raise their kids or you think they might raise their kids or you think about like, oh, in kindergarten, my kid goes over to this person's house and they just sit on an iPad the whole time. Like, do you want that? It's like, 
-hmm. it's such a new thing for me to even, I mean, you guys are much more in it than I am, but it's like, uh, just shows you sometimes you have to just like let go. And then other times I'm like, should we all just like all move together and like live on yeah. Yeah. together like a, yeah a commune, we like talk, a by the way situation the answer is yes it's our and it's our dream and we talk about yeah. it all the time and I'm like yeah I'm like it's all I want to do I know. um because it, it does make it easier and also it eliminates some of the hard conversations when you're like someone's like oh we're gonna uh, you know I was gonna let them do blah 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 at the house and I'm like mm, you know actually we kind of don't we don't do that but um it's totally cool like I can come over I can you know hang with them like whatever it is because I'm of course like I'm one of those people that I'm I show up at a play date I'm there I'm just gonna hang out because also like I have a sort of if unless I'm really close to somebody I need to feel very comfortable with like the space that they're in and who they're hanging out with and like who's at the house and like if there's older siblings or like whatever it is um so I think all of that is just like, yes, to the commune. Um, But also, uh, I think it's just great to like, you know, to sort of, I don't know, you have an understanding. I mean, you becoming a mom during COVID, like that's tough. You really missed out on those like mommy and me circles and like finding Mm -hmm. those like very first moms that you're going, oh, your baby's starting to crawl. My baby's starting to crawl, you Mm -hmm. know, like those moments where you're sort of learning and growing. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit because um, just talking about your like family values and the way that you were brought up. And then um, you wrote this book about forgiveness, which was, you know, like these stories from other people's lives. And um, I know you and Chris, you know, talk about your faith and um, just your, you know, family core values and things like that. I was brought up in a very religious home. um, And so was Teresa. Um, I was brought up as a Southern Baptist. My dad was a pastor and um, Teresa grew up Catholic Catholic and and, um, there's so you know obviously like I've pivoted away from the religion side of it but kept all the good juicy stuff from faith that I so believe in the spirituality and just like the morals that were sort of instilled in me Um, so with your like how do you do it in your home with your girls and your family Um, do you guys you know talk about your faith with your kids you know I grew up also Catholic I'm Catholic Um, and so we my especially my mom's side of the family is like very catholic my my grandma my grandpa my yeah. grandpa went to church every single day my, my mom still um, does yeah exactly <laughs> and uh i you know growing up we went to the catholic church here that's nearby where we live which i still go to and mm-hmm. um and i definitely when i was growing up we went every single sunday as a family it was kind of one of those things that it was like no questions asked every Sunday morning. We went as a family to church. Then as we got older, we went to Sunday school. We did our first communion. We did our confirmation. Yes, um, me too. And, uh, and then as I went into college, I, you know, was all of 25 minutes away from the church. So I was kind of like, I'm in downtown LA now. I don't see myself coming back every single weekend to go to church with my family. <laughs> Love it. Um, and I, mm-hmm. I definitely like took time to figure out like what the role of that kind of core pillar of my life, like how that would play into my life as I was in college, as I kind of figured out, you know, my life. And I definitely think my parents, you know, we were raised Catholic. My, my mom's whole family is very Catholic. When we all get together in the summer, we go to church together and it's a big part of us. I will say that a lot of it has to do with the person who leads at your church, like our yes. church in Santa Monica. My yeah. friend's kid got christened there and I was like, oh yeah, we God. just baptized our girls there Aww, too. Yeah. So, so cool. it's the, the, priest who's been there since I mean he baptized me just to give you an idea of how long he's been there wow. and he just baptized my girls yeah and he married Chris and I like oh he's my been gosh. there and the reason for me going there of course I you know I have I've been to a ton of different Catholic churches but really the reason for me wanting to bring my girls back to this church and when we got married to get married in that church was really because of him and 
it was because he really creates an environment that even though it is a Catholic church, he welcomes everyone, no matter mm, wow. what you're doing in your life, who you are, what you've done, if you're divorced, if you've, you know, like what your sexual preferences are. Like he welcomes, he's like, everybody comes wow. here, no matter. Yeah. This is that an is open so door, open community. Yeah. yeah. And so that's why, you know, for me, I love going to hear him speak and I love going to that church because I know that it's a church that welcomes everyone. Mm. And I know there are a lot of kind of uh, more traditional Catholic churches yeah. uh, that don't have that kind of a, you know, um, a feeling, but the, the way that I feel around him mm. and also the way the environment that he has created in his church is one that I love and admire and also one that I want my girls to grow up in also mm. feeling like no matter what they do in life that they can always come back there that they can always yes. you know if I they love it you know so stray from the church they can come back if they yeah um you know they don't feel like oh because I've you know I did something or because I chose to do something whatever it is that I can't I'm not welcome here or this mm -hmm. shuns certain people or excludes certain people I mean I've gone there with my Jewish friends I've brought my you know friends from all walks of life all backgrounds mm -hmm. all religions and he's always like bring everyone like yeah come, come one come all and so for me, that's, um, it's definitely I've, as I've gotten married, and also as I've had my own kids, I've come back to really look back on my childhood and my upbringing when it comes to my religion and my faith, as wanting to have that be more of a part of my life and also my kids lives, because mm. faith is such a, you know, faith and spirituality can have so many different meanings. I always argued with my mom and my grandma that I didn't need to go you know, see God or pray to God. I didn't have to do that in a church to connect with God or to pray that I felt like I could do that in nature. I could do that at the beach. I could do that in a forest somewhere. And I do believe that for sure. Like I think that, you know, we pray at night as a family or we pray before meals as a family. And when we do, we go to uh, my mom's house every Sunday for dinner. My daughter, Lila, now, if somebody starts eating before, she'll say, wait, we forgot to say grace. And she'll, you know, Aww. she like stops everybody and every single night, even though we don't necessarily go through a whole, um, a whole proper prayer every single time, she'll always make everyone stop and go around the table and say what they're grateful for, which was mm. something that my mom uh. started doing. And so, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be Catholic focus, but to have mm. faith be a part of your life is definitely yes. very important to Chris and I. And it's, uh, it's important to, you know, my whole extended family and and definitely a big part of how we want to raise our kids is to have faith and spirituality and a belief system and uh, feel that they're welcome at, you know, wherever they choose to kind of go in their life. But also, you know, they were both baptized and uh, raised, being raised Catholic and also being raised to be aware and loving and accepting and admire all different kinds of people's choices with religion and spirituality that and that they can feel a relationship to God when they're going on a hike or when they're at the beach. And also that they know that, you know, part of what we do is also go to church together as a family and pray as a family and, um, and have that be a part of our life. Hearing you speak is bringing up so much for me. And I'm realizing like, <laughs> I feel like it was such a gift re being raised in with so much faith. Like what a gift mm -hmm. I had as a child. I went to a Catholic school for 13 years and I would say like hearing you talk about your church and your relationship to that priest and, and the way he is, he's so open and so accepting and so loving. And I think I really craved that from my Catholic faith yeah. growing up. And that's when I started to question my own faith was the judgment aspect because my for mom- sure is so traditional in her beliefs. Mm -hmm. So even this Pope is like very progressive for her. The fact yeah. that he's like, all are welcome, all are welcome in the church. Yeah. She was like, but wait, I, I was taught like with Vatican I. So she will start going back through. And so right now she's feeling very disappointed that the Latin mass is being phased out. 
So that's her like traditional mass where she wears yeah. her black veil over her <laughs> face and she like yeah. doesn't touch the Eucharist. She like sticks her tongue out and she gets it directly like onto yeah. her tongue. So that's all being phased out. But for my wow. mom, it's quite confronting. Yeah. But that's how I was raised. Like I went to the Legion of Mary every Thursday night. I like had to kneel down to pray. And so I feel like imagine if I had access to the sort of environment you're talking about, like a church yes. that was like all welcome. This is such a beautiful thing. Let's all be together. Let's be love. Let's be accepting of everyone. I feel like my relationship to Catholicism would have been different. And yeah. I'm hearing this and like, oh, I want to go and talk to your priest. And <laughs> I would should. I feel like I need to you unpack. Should. I've got to unpack some of the things that I went through because I was, was so fearful of the wrath of God for so many years um, that I ended up kind of turning my back on that aspect of my life so much and, you know, reformulating my idea with faith and um, like Sarah, like I'm very spiritual, but I do love the tradition of church. I, I know. The other day I woke up, it was Easter and I was like, oh my gosh, I just want to gather the kids up and like put on go some nice Easter dresses service. and outfits. <laughs> yeah, and go to the Easter service, but I wouldn't even know, know. where to go or where to start. And I've had <laughs> this like chip on my shoulder for so many years. But it is very interesting talking to my mum about this and helping her to evolve her idea of faith. Um, yes. And it's scary for her because she's almost 70. So yeah. change is scary and her tradition of Catholicism you know, it's confronting for her, but I can see little by little, she's being a little bit more open. And also like, you know, my mom grew up very traditional Catholic. So she experienced and also has always talked to us a lot about the Catholic guilt that, you know, was instilled in her and, you know, to feel ne never to talk about, you know, sex, never to talk about no. divorce, never to talk about, you know, all these different things. And she definitely had wanted to have a different relationship with us kids about, you know, being comfortable talking about those things. And, um, and I, I really think that it has so much to do with who's leading at your church. And yes. there are plenty of things, as I said, in my forgiveness book, there are plenty of things that, you know, are in the traditional Catholic church that I don't agree with. Mm -hmm. You know, there are certain parts of it that I, you know, I have a hard time wrapping my head around and my mom talks about the exact same thing. But I think that again, it's about who's leading your specific church and, yeah. And uh, what kind of environment they create for your community or for your family or, you know, what you want your children to grow up in. And since I've started, you know, when, especially during COVID, when it started opening up and we started going back to church, my daughter, Lila, like loves it. She's like a little oh, mayor. Yeah. She walks through the thing and she's like, what's your name? What are you doing? What's this? Is that baby Jesus up there? Where's his oh. mommy? Like she like will go around and talk oh about the whole God. thing. So it's fun to be able to see her now. And, uh, and yeah, our, you know, our priest at our, our church also like welcomes all of those curiosities. Cause I always asked my grandma all those questions, like all the questions that would make my mom just be like, oh my gosh, Shut I her. can't believe you're asking. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what's this about? What are we doing here? Like, why is that that way? So yes. he also like encourages those conversations uh, and those questions, which wow. I also love about it. So I, yeah. I think you just absolutely hit the nail on the head by talking about it, it being the person who leads your church, because, yeah. um, you know, the for me the the evolution was like finding people who were more open questioning was actually not okay um when i was a kid so my curiosity is that i would constantly be asking the questions it was very triggering for everyone around me because a they didn't have the answers and b it was like whoa you're really rocking the boat and you're the preacher's mm -hmm. kid you know rocking yeah. the boat um but i think you're so right and um and finding a place where you have someone that you know really welcomes all and that you align with and that you're like okay maybe i don't follow every single thing of this religion but you know this is a place where i feel welcome and the people that i mm -hmm. love feel welcome and our values and stuff are aligned so um that was that's that's amazing and i so appreciate you answering um, that because faith is so personal and your religion is so personal. But, um, but I think that uh, it's really good for us to talk about this stuff because a lot of people, 
do feel like, and this is some of the feedback that I've gotten just through people knowing that I was Southern Baptist, a lot of people do feel like you can't ask those questions. And um, I don't know why <laughs> that we can't yeah. ask, you know, these like curious questions that you're talking about that you brought to your priest. I don't know why that it, it's so triggering um, because I feel like it just shakes the core of everything that the religion is built on. Um, yeah. My mom also like always encouraged us to be curious. My mom's the most curious person <laughs> ever. <laughs> so she always encouraged us to be, you know, really curious and also that's how she raised us in our, in our house, both my parents, it was always, you know, everyone is welcome. And so I think finding a place in a church where there's also that, you know, that you're not excluded if you, um, if you're divorced or you're not, you know, yeah. they, no one says like, oh, you can't come here if you're, you know, if you're gay or if you're straight, whatever the situation is, it's, we wanted to be able to find somewhere that's like, you know, you're, you can come here if you have, addiction in your fit. You can come here if you're divorced, you can come here if you're gay, if you're straight, whatever your preference is, whatever you're doing in your life, whatever, you know, you, whatever your walk of life is, you're welcome. And that's how I want to raise my kids is I want to raise yeah. my kids that like love everyone, ge- like no matter what everyone's, yeah, whatever of- anyone chooses to do with their life, someone, you know, it's like judgment free of just like welcome and love and accept everyone. And that's, how I was raised. And it's definitely how I want to raise my kids as well. What a, what a beautiful, like next generation of people who have faith that is open and welcoming. And I just Mm -hmm. wish I could liberate my mom, my mom's (laughs) experience of like the Catholic guilt of being a divorced woman Mm -hmm. in the Catholic church. Like she still goes to and says her penance like every day thinking that she's going to go to hell because she was divorced because she got divorced and it's so and I was like mom it's changed like go with the times the catholic church is changing like it's okay (laughs) it's hard though for them unshackle (laughs) yeah it's hard to wrap you know also a, a generation that grew up with it being such a specific way it's definitely very unfamiliar. I remember like when my mom, my mom's been very open about her journey with getting divorced and also like what a foreign concept that was, you know, and I mean, my grandma wasn't alive when my mom and my dad got separated, but it was, you know, it wasn't something that I think she was even like able to wrap her head around and that she's done a ton of exploration and, you know, research and just like being really open and interested and curious about her relationship with that. And also wrapping her head around that because she grew up very, very Catholic. And so mm-hmm. that's, you know, it's the same thing as, you know, your mom feels it's understanding and also having that generation look at it and be like, oh my gosh, that's so foreign to me that that's even like acceptable. <laughs> and yeah. 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 So totally. yeah, it's, it's interesting. I'd love to talk about your kid's book because Sarah, it's called Good Night Sister and Sarah has a copy of it and she told me what it's about and I was like, oh, I need to send you tears. a copy now that you're in America. Oh my, yes, please. <laughs> oh my gosh. Immediate tears. The idea of these two little girls and them sleeping in the same bed and then one of them getting a big girl. But I just started crying thinking about it. <laughs> what? Where did the idea come from? And in your words, like, what is the book about? Why did you write it? I mean, it really came from just me becoming a new mom in a very isolated time. I I feel like everybody always told me about kind of being pregnant. You kind of, for me, at least, I knew I always wanted to be a mom and I kind of fantasized what my you know, what my first pregnancy would be like and becoming a mom would be like. And because it was during COVID, it was not at all kind of what I had envisioned as far as like being around all my girl cousins and my aunts and my extended family and being with my mom and my sister. And um, it was very isolating, especially postpartum. And I didn't know also like nobody talked about postpartum to me. Nobody was like, this is going to happen. You're going to be really emotional and you're going to, you know, so I was kind of, um, I was not very prepared for that experience, but I, people would say to me like, oh, you know, you might feel like you have the baby blues or you might feel like, you know, postpartum, you feel really overwhelmed or anxious. And then on top of it, there was all of this kind of pandemic anxiety for new moms 
also of just like, you know, you want to be around your family, but you don't want to expose your baby to some sickness or, you know, so there were a lot of things that were going on. But one of the things that really caught me off guard that I was surprised by was the amount of times that I would be sitting alone with, with Lila and even with my second daughter, Eloise, where I found myself just completely alone with my baby, you know, breastfeeding or sitting in the nursery together. And I was kind of like overwhelmed by these memories of my childhood. And I was like flooded with memories. And I look back on my childhood and I just like loved my childhood. I, you know, I think I had such a magical experience as a child and I'm so grateful that I was able to have that. And also that I have the parents that I have and the siblings that I have. And I had always just kind of like, you know, I've, I've definitely done my fair share of work in therapy and I've reflected on certain parts of my childhood. So I was always aware and had a good relationship with reflections. But I think for me, I was very emotional about like thinking, I, I remember sitting with my daughter and I was like, oh my gosh, I have a daughter. And I started thinking, oh, my parents did this exact same thing. Like my parents were at one point crazy in love with each other and together in this happy marriage. And then they brought me home and then they brought each of my siblings home and they were together and now they're not together. And I would, you know, I was like, so upset about that. And like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it all. I'm I'm like feeling all of these things now Mm. as a new mom myself. And then I would start thinking of all of these memories of me when I was little, like running through the halls of my house and with my sister, everything was with my sister because we're 19 months apart. And, (laughs) you know, we had, we shared a bathroom and we Uh did everything together. And so kind of sitting with all of those feelings and all of those emotions and kind of trying to, you know, feel them and experience them while also navigating new motherhood. I kind of wanted to write a book I was coming off of writing a book on forgiveness, which was a very heavy and intense topic. Very heavy. uh, (laughs) Yeah. And so I wanted to do something that was, you know, more lighthearted. And I just had so much, I've always had a huge amount of love for my sister and also just my siblings and my family. But I had this kind of like boom of love for sisterhood, really. And just like all the memories I had with my sister. And so I wanted to write a book celebrating sisterhood and also the dynamic between her and I. And um, I finished it kind of within the first like year or year and a half of, uh, of Lila's life and then finished it, getting ready for it to come out and then had a second girl right before oh this book came gosh. out. So I was like, now I have sisters in my two girls. And so I'm going to yeah. go and talk about sisterhood. Wow. So that was a pleasant surprise. <laughs> and what's their um, age gap? Yeah. Their age gap is about 20 months, a little over 20 oh months. Gosh. So very close. Gosh. Yeah, very similar crazy. to Christina and I. So it's it's crazy also because my mom saved pretty much all of mine and Christina's matching outfits. So I'm oh like, my this gosh. is working. This is working Nar. very well for me to like Nar. recreate all of these, you know, moments and outfit situations. So yeah, it's really fun. Gosh, gosh, gosh. <laughs> uh, Oshkosh, 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 and also like Florence Iceman, like all of these like old school brands that my mom and my grandma would buy. And I'm like, these are oh still God. like very cute. Oh, yeah, vintage. I mean, I yeah. know. vintage moments always. Yeah. Wow. And Lila, my daughter Lila is like obsessed because my mom saved a lot of my little party shoes and now she's able to wear them. So oh, she will run around the house and just. I'm wearing mommy's shoes. So I'm like, this is great. <laughs> My mom's like storage units have paid off. <laughs> See, I mean, this is why I can't oh, get rid of my storage so unit because one day my daughters are going to be wearing all these clothes I've saved for them. <laughs> I love it. That is so cool. I mean, I love the book and my kids love the book. And um, and it's just like, like you're you're amazing. Like you 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 have this book come out. It totally blows up everyone. So, I mean, it's so good. Um, and uh, yeah, another, another one of your books that have just like skyrocketed to the top of, um, all of the lists or charts or whatever you want to call it. So, um, I just, I thought it was so 
sweet. And my daughter was obsessed with the unicorn. I think I wrote you and was just like, I've been trying yeah. to find this unicorn everywhere because she, she'll look, she'll be like, oh, she's two and a half. And she's like, oh, I wish that I had a unicorn like that. And I'm like, okay, Girl, thanks, I'll, Catherine. I'll try to yeah. find it. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I mean, it was really like the whole goal of it was just to celebrate sisterhood, honestly. Yes. And even if you don't have a sister, because there were t- yeah. so many people who were like, now my kid's asking for a sister, but it wasn't like, it, it was, it's to celebrate sisterhood in its, you know, its many forms. And also as adults mm. reading this book to our kids, like you don't have to have a sister. It can be with a cousin or with a, you know, a parent or an aunt or a friend. It's just about having that relationship with somebody that you feel comfortable enough to turn to when you feel like yes scared or nervous or that you need extra support and if that's a sister great if that's a brother wonderful and if that's like a cousin or a friend and even Mm -hmm. you know as adults reading this book to our kids it's like also about looking at you know, who are the sisters that we found later in life? Like, you know, you guys have of people that we look at as, as being sister like that we've been able to become friends with as we've gotten older and lean on in times of need. And just the importance Mm -hmm. of having that bond and connection with someone in your life that you feel like you can turn to and say, like, you know, I need an extra cuddle right now, or I need some support in this space. And, you know, I've already been uh, you know, harassed by my brothers of like, why didn't you write a good night brother? When is good night brother coming? <laughs> it's a nice foundation though. You know, it's like, it, it really is. Like it gives you that comfort, that grounding. Like when you find a best friend, you know, if it's your brother, if it's whatever it is, that those relationships are so grounding and so amazing. Yeah, they are. Um, your, so I just wanted to ask you before we, we get to the end of this, I could talk to you for so long. I know. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I want to ask you about, um, your like motherhood journey now, you know, you're, I'm sure that with all the stuff that you've written before you became a mom and now, you know, like your perspective on the world and everything, I'm sure. I mean, obviously you've talked about becoming a mother during 2020, which is, um, you know, wild I had my time. third, yeah, wow, wow times, man. I had my third baby in, in 2020 and I was like, dang, I feel for the moms that are like having their kids, you know, for the first time during this time, because isolation is the reason why Teresa and I started yours and mama a long time ago. It's like, we mm-hmm. did not, we don't, our families are not from here. I'm from Kentucky. She's from Adelaide, Australia. So you know, when we were having babies, we were, we didn't have community here. It was Mm -hmm. like, we had our friends, but it was, you know, we were kind of the first of our friends having children. And so Mm -hmm. um, without having that family foundation, it was isolating. And so we were starving for community and trying to find like going to all the mom stuff and like, you know, oh, you have that stroller. So do I, you want to be my best friend? You know, just like whatever, (laughs) whatever we could do to be like, okay, are you sleeping? Cause I'm not, Um, is that normal you know just like (laughs) any of that stuff and so you know becoming a mom during this pandemic like um I'm sure was such a struggle but like you know can you talk to us about sort of your perspective and just how everything changed and how you look at the world differently now being a mother and any of those things yeah I mean I I honestly think that it was probably harder for people like you who had who became, you know, parents for the third time or the fourth time or second time, whatever it is in the pandemic, because you had a pregnancy or an experience before that to compare it to where you were like, why aren't I having this freedom again? Or why is this so different? Or, you know, I, I, this is, it's, you had something to compare it to. I didn't have anything to compare it to. So I feel like in a way, um, that was, a little bit of a gift with, you know, uh, having my first daughter in like 2020 in the thick of the pandemic was that I didn't really, I had a kind of a vision of what I thought or what I wanted or dreamt of when it came to becoming a mom for the first time. But I didn't have an experience, you know, of having a child in life before the pandemic. So um, I look at my, you know, my girlfriends who um, who had babies before the pandemic and then, you know, had a baby even last year, my best friend, one of my best friends had a baby last year and she had such a different experience that she was like, 
I'm, this is it for me. Like, I'm not having any more kids. This was way too stressful. (laughs) It was a terrible experience. Like I did not have fun. Like I did in my other two pregnancies and Mm. you know, it's a a whole different set of stresses and anxieties and unknown. And, you know, you, you already have a variety of those things when you're pregnant, no matter when you're pregnant, but you know, with a lot of the things going on in the world for different people, they absorb that differently or manage that differently. And it's, uh, can be a different kind of an experience. So, you know, yes, it was not ideal, obviously to have that be my first experience. And, you know, it was all that I knew. So it wasn't, uh, when I had my second daughter last year, I definitely felt like, okay, this is very different. Like I can actually see my family. I can see some people here or there. I can have, you know, uh, I can have people around to help me that I feel like are safe and that I can, you know, trust to be healthy and mindful of a newborn. And Mm -hmm. I felt like that was, that was definitely nicer. And then also I was kind of like, I feel like for me in the beginning, when you first bring home a newborn, you so don't want to get them sick. I kind of was like, I a little bit preferred the the fact that like nobody asked to come over the first time when I had Lila because it was, yeah, it was kind of like, I didn't have to worry. Like, did this person get the baby sick? And I was definitely more anxious. Um, you know, postpartum, I was anxious both times of just being like, you know, who I was having around the baby and who I was having around my kids and like how that, uh, you know, bringing things into the home, that was always something that I was much more anxious about. But, um, Yeah. I mean, I think for me, as I said before, like I always wanted to be a mom. I'm the oldest of my siblings. My, uh, my youngest brother, Christopher is eight years younger than me. So I vividly remember him coming home from the hospital. And I remember my mom being pregnant with him. And, and, uh, I, when Christopher came home from the hospital, he was like, my real life baby. Like I, (laughs) I had all those baby (laughs) dolls that like you would feed the baby dolls things. It would go to the bathroom. You would change its diaper. Like I was into all of that. I, I would babysit people's Furbies. (laughs) Yeah. I would babysit people's Furbies because they needed care. I would take Tamagotchis because they needed to be, like all the things that, yeah, everything that you could have as a young child that would give you some sort of responsibility. I was like, give it to me. (laughs) So I was, uh, So like, I, I feel like I always, you know, I knew I wanted to have kids and that I was excited about that. And, you know, I feel like the moments of just being overwhelmed with the amount of like being just nostalgic for me was the biggest surprise. I know everybody always says the sleep deprivation is the biggest surprise or just like your body postpartum is the biggest surprise. I felt like those things people talk about all the time, like you're not going to sleep okay, you're not going to, your body's going to look crazy Mm -hmm. or you're not going to know what your body looks like in the mirror for the first time. And, you know, you're going to have all this care for yourself and your breastfeeding journey, all those things I had heard about. So I was kind of prepared for, you know, in some way that those things were coming or would, would come up and, um, and I wasn't necessarily prepared for each of them, but I had heard them before in conversation. So I had them on my radar, but it was really just, I feel like, the uh, nostalgia that really mm. surprised me both times of just being like uh, so overwhelmed with so much love, not only for my kids, but also just reflecting on my childhood and also my parents. And I don't know if Ugh. it's because my parents aren't together anymore. Like, mm. I, I don't know if that was it. And I also yeah. didn't know if part of it was like, I was then like kind of refeeling all of these feelings of my parents now not being together, even Mm -hmm. though my parents, you know, we do so much as a family and my parents are together, you know, like they're around each other all the time. They, and they have such a deep love for one another. They were together for like 35 years. So they definitely have like tons of history together and the four of us kids together. But I feel like almost the, my postpartum experiences with both girls was almost Mm -hmm. like, Refeeling all of those feelings again mm, that totally wow. caught me off guard. I was like, yes. I thought I already did years of therapy about this. Like, and like, <laughs> yes. I was like, I thought I handled this more but to I, unpack I, than you expected. Yeah, it was more to unpack for sure, and also just like looking at my siblings and seeing like seeing my two parents be with their grandkids mm. and seeing them together with their grandkids, like 
those for me, I was like, <laughs> like I was just like <laughs> so, so emotional about all yeah. of those times. It's very just, confronting. It, it is. is. It's so, it's so confronting. And it also, you know, like there is nothing as far as like a filter to hide behind as, of like, you know, like you're fine. I got this. Cause I was with my siblings and then I would look at my siblings and I'd be like, I just love you all so much. Like I love my Aww. brothers so much and my sister. And it's I just, just was like, more love. Uh, yeah. More <laughs> so love. Much and more also, love. <laughs> yeah. So much more love. And also just like, I even like it went as far as like going to my uncles and my aunts and my cousins. And I was like, I just loved all of you. <laughs> I just <laughs> like love I you. a love drug. <laughs> yes. I felt like that too. I felt I like too. that too. And then I yeah, saw the inner child in every person. Like I yes. would look at each person just be, you were just but a little baby that was like nursed and like, and it helped me not so be mad tears. at people. It actually yeah. like, you know, if yeah, you're like have, on like, the highway different... and someone cuts you off, I'm like, oh, but you were just a wee little sweet thing that someone yeah, just and loved. also like <laughs> look at people. It also made me look at my parents as little kids. And I was like, yeah. I had such such different mm-hmm. views of just like grown adults. I've had empathy in a different way. I've always been like, and I've always had empathy, you know, for people and their journeys, but I also just like looked at people very differently. I will say that this past book tour mm-hmm. was definitely a different experience having two kids. Oh, <laughs> I yeah. mean, wow. Like <laughs> wow. you guys know this very well because yes. you guys are working moms, but I, I will say I learned a lot this time around with this book launch. I overextended myself for sure. Like I overbooked and I was like, I learned my lesson very quickly that that you can't, for me at least, I couldn't do, you know, six different cities in 10 days with two babies in tow and, you know, going at the same pace that I had in the past. And I thought that I could, Mm -hmm. and I quickly learned that um, that lesson very, uh, very quickly. And it was, you know, for me, I didn't necessarily like love that I wasn't able to do that, but it was, I was like, okay, you know what? I can't do the same kinds of book tours that I had done in the past and that's okay. And, and, uh, so that was a learning lesson for me when you, when you talk about like different learning lessons, yes, yes. With becoming a new parent, that was different because I hadn't, you know, with my first daughter, Lila, I hadn't, really left the house like she everybody said to me like are you gonna give her a bottle she didn't have a bottle my my (laughs) oldest daughter Lila did not have a bottle she was exclusively breastfed because I didn't yeah I bought all these bottles and (laughs) I never needed to use them because I never left her like she was with me the entire time yeah and now you know with Eloise she she'll have a bottle occasionally but still you know like I'm I'm still breastfeeding her she's 10 months old and it's um yeah it's definitely very a very different experience like leaving the home and trying to fit in work things while you're I mean you guys know this very well it's like well the whole breastfeeding just, is yeah I was gonna say yeah. the two-year-olds just move really slow like it's one thing that I'm just you know still realizing like as a third time mom with my two-year-old is that like I'm definitely more patient I think with winter than I was with some of my with some of my other children um than my other two children <laughs> because <laughs> because I look at her and I go, she needs to move slow. This is how her brain works. This is Mm -hmm. how she works. Like she's not interested in racing out the door to get A, B, and C done. She's like wanting to put her crock on by herself after she goes and picks out her own underwear and, Mm -hmm. you know, is trying to put those on. So it's like, you know, it's, it's funny. Like I watch her and I'm like, Oh yeah. I, you know, it makes me smile because with my other ones, I was like, Oh my God, we're gonna be so late. Oh, can I just put it on for yeah. you? And toddlers are like, no, you know? Yeah, and it's just they like, really are. <laughs> but that's why I think about you with two babies, like breastfeeding one and a toddler, like racing around trying to do this book tour. Like that is really difficult. So that, that age and traveling and, mm-hmm. you know, working at the same time, like what, Teresa and I have both been through that. That is a lot. And, you know, it's that's a lot. great, great lesson to learn. <laughs> great lesson to learn. I mean, it was yeah. like going backstage at all the different like shows and also book tours with my pump in. Oh. I was like, this is different. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Isn't it wild? It's one. just <laughs> wild. And we always say like when you learn, you learn to become good 
at like lovingly putting a boundary in place and being like, actually, no, I need yeah. to say no to these particular things. And by mm-hmm. saying no, you're actually saying yes to self-care and yes to your family. It's so and true. And then you can free yourself from the guilt of that. But, yeah, it took me a while too. I was always like, yes, and, yes, and, yes, and. I can and. do it all. Yeah. I can Suddenly do it all. I was yeah. like, oh, yeah. actually, I, I can't. And something's going to suffer. Something's going to suffer here. And it yeah. might even be like – my work, my professional work might suffer mm-hmm. if I'm saying yes to so many other things. Right. Yeah, you can't pour from an empty cup. Oh, it's true. Very thank true. you so much for being thank here with us today, both. Catherine. <laughs> uh, you're amazing. And I'm you so, are so, amazing. so happy that you came on our show. And um, you guys, if you haven't checked out BDA Baby, um, you know, I feel like you created such a beautiful community with what you're doing on your platform, you know, and maybe part of that was coming out of like being in a, you know, pandemic yeah. for the first time and wanting to learn. <laughs> and like, you know, that's yeah. kind of what I saw unfolding as you you were starting the show Mm -hmm. um but I love seeing it and catching up on like you know some of the people that you have on because it's it's amazing like just hearing everyone's journey and how different it is and all the information that's out there like of course like this is mine and Teresa's passion so like we love 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 to learn as much as possible um but Anyway, you guys should check out BDA Baby on Catherine's Instagram. It's fantastic. And all of her books, you can just Google Uh Catherine Schwarzenegger's books. (laughs) Yeah. And then all of them will come up. (laughs) But Good Night Sister is the um the new children's book that you guys should check out. Um thank you. We love it. Esme gives it two thumbs up. Winter gives it two thumbs up. And Wyatt loves to read it to them, which is really cute. That's so sweet. Um, Well, thank you both so much for having me. And I was, I remember when I both came across both of you uh, on your social media accounts I was like I feel I remember I turned to Chris and I was like I feel like I found two people who like birth videos as much as I do and <laughs> this, this is like this is gonna be good this is gonna yeah. be good yeah. like years uh, ago yeah. yeah so it's yeah. been okay. it's been so great also for me as a new mom like especially during the pandemic I know tons of people sent me both of your what you guys both do and also what you stand for when I was pregnant with Lila so almost 3 oh. years ago 2 and a half years ago but I just it's you know for me as someone who became a mom in a very isolating time to have both of you feel even though I didn't like even talk to you guys before that it was so comforting to have both of you guys you know in a virtual way but also just like even the community that you guys have created to have that support in a very you know like unknown time for so many Mm -hmm. people and even to be able to like have that information and just like that um you know social media place where we could us new moms during a pandemic turn to and also like get advice from both of you in the community that, and support in the community that you guys have created is awesome. So thank you both for just being Aww. such leaders in that space and also being so comforting for me as a new mom in my two and a half years and also in both pregnancies and also just like all the stuff that you guys post and talk about and just lifting other moms and people up is so refreshing and I think so needed. And I'm very grateful that you guys asked me to come on and talk to you. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much, Catherine. Yes, so sweet. Oh, yeah, on a commune. And here we come. I know. I know. We're moving <laughs> in. I'm bringing over yeah. my trailer. We're moving in. Let's do it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, uh, you guys can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We love you, Daisies. Thank you. Love you.